This is the Aurelius Podcast, episode 50 with John Colco. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder at Aurelius and your host for the Aurelius Podcast, where we discuss all things UX, research, and product. In this episode, we have John Colco. He's a partner at Modernist Studio, former director and founder of the Austin Center for Design and author of Exposing the Magic of Design and Thoughts on Interaction Design. Suffice it to say, John has a ton of experience and thinks deeply about the world of UX, research, and building products. John and I talked about a range of topics within UX, specifically doing research, making sense of data to come to real insights, and how to share those in a way that can truly guide you in designing and building the right products or features. His experience in research data analysis and synthesis is pivotal in my opinion, and something I continuously learn from when I revisit his writings and thoughts. I'm very sure that John's experience and opinions on how we do this work we call UX and design research is going to give you something to think about and elevate the work you do as well. The Aurelius podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the powerful research repository and insights platform. Aurelius is an all-in-one space for researchers to organize notes, capture insights, analyze data, and share outcomes with your team. We recently announced two of our biggest features yet. Aurelius now offers transcriptions and our automatic report builder. You can add any audio or video recording and have notes created for you automatically. Then Aurelius creates a report with every key insight and recommendation from your project, which you can then edit, design, and share with anyone right from Aurelius. Check us out at AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. All right, let's get to it. Hey, John. You're good. Hello. (laughs) How's it going? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing just fine. Really appreciate you jumping on and joining us for an episode of our podcast. I've been following your work for quite some time. Big fan. So this is also selfishly, personally exciting to be able to have you on and kind of interview you, chat about the work you've done. I appreciate it, Zach. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. So as we do before uh, or at the beginning of every episode, kind of ask the guests, introduce yourself if you would, talk about some of the work you've done, the things that you're passionate about in our field and otherwise, uh, just in case, you know, folks listening don't actually know who you are and not familiar with you. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll just share a little bit about myself. So I run a studio here with two other partners called Modernist Studio, and we focus on design strategy. So we help our clients see the future and then we help them build it. And a lot of what we do here is grounded in some of the things I've been thinking about over the past few years, some of the books I've written, and some of the ideas that I've just sort of been kicking around. But when we think a little bit about what we do here, we conduct qualitative research. We spend some time with people, really get to know them, get to understand them, get to empathize with them. We synthesize that into meaningful insights. And then we draw. And often we draw by hand, but we also draw on a computer. We make high fidelity visuals, movies, interactivity to show Here's what a future may look like. And I know one of the things that's sort of in the middle there is that idea of synthesis or making sense of data was one of the things that, Zach, perhaps we could we could speak a little bit about that might be useful to, to some of your, your audience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, most of the folks who are listening to us are definitely in the UX field, either as designers or researchers specifically, but people on the periphery of that too, right? So product managers, marketers, and things like that, all folks who are doing exactly that work, just trying to understand people really well to help inform and make some decisions about serving their needs, right? So you are definitely well-versed in that. And I would definitely like to kind of dig into that topic a little bit more. So you need to talk about synthesis, analysis, sense-making, whatever term somebody might want to use for that. Curious if even to cue that up, if you can kind of give your definition of what that is for folks. Yeah, I can try to define a little bit about what sense making or synthesis is. And I, I think maybe it, it's best served by way of an example. And so, you know, imagine that you're out there in the field and you're doing research. And I'll give you an, a real example. We recently conducted some research in the context of finance. And so we spent some time with folks trying to understand things around debt and the way they manage their money and different things around how they think about and how they feel about money. And so if you stop there, you've done some research, you've learned some things, but that research alone doesn't really tell you what to go make. It's very informative. It's useful. It's fun. I think a lot of people enjoy the design research part because it's, it's very human. I mean, you're, you're spending some quality time with people in an intimate setting, but at the end of the day, if you're actually intending to make something to make something that will help those folks improve the quality of life, to add value to the company, to make a lot of money, we have to translate that in some way. And so that synthesis part or sense-making part is how we start to find hidden connections between what we've learned 
uh, and start to find meaningful insights or provocations about what we could do to change in somebody's existing state in order to make it a better state. I mean, that could be something like introducing a new product or service, introducing a new policy in some cases, which is not financially lucrative. It could mean getting rid of a new <laughs> product or a system or a service. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but one of the things you do learn through the research process and then that synthesis process is that the folks that you're designing for uh, or designing with are very, very different than you. And that's, that's almost entirely true, even if you're the one even if you share ideas with the folks and you're the one that's in their, their shoes, and to go back to my finance example, you know, I'm neither poor nor extraordinarily affluent. I'm, I'm sort of in the upper middle class, but we spend some time with folks who are on those extremes, who are you know, the owners of massive yachts and folks living paycheck to paycheck. And the research alone, I can say, well, you know, wow, I could sympathize with folks and say, wow, that would suck to be paycheck to paycheck, or I can, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, want after the folks with the yacht, I suppose. But then to actually design something for either of those folks means looking hard at the data we've learned, connecting it to something I do know, connecting it to um, patterns I see in the world around me, and then creating a provocation. So I suppose the long-winded way around, uh, the simple way of saying that is it's about for me anyway, finding hidden connections in data, finding patterns, and then using that to provoke new ideas. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't think that you would make any claim to draw a line in the sand and say, this is the definition, but that is, uh, it's a pretty damn good one. And a couple of things that I, I want to pull out of what you said too. I mean, first of all, just a reaction to that, because, you know, at Aurelius, we actually, ha it is a user research uh, platform. It's a research platform for the most part. Now I am a UX written research person, I can relate to that so much as to where, you know, you assume well, we're, we're building this for people who are just like us. It's no problem. But then you go and you do research with your customers who are the very same people you are in the very same industry, doing the very same job. And you realize just how much you don't know, um, even when it's like quite literally in your backyard. Right. So I think that that's just, it's one of those things I feel like we keep saying over and over throughout time in our industry, but uh, it's important to keep in mind that no matter how close to this you are, the research will always uncover something you didn't think about. And sort of with that, you know, the other thing I wanted to, I guess, comment on or, or react to is, as you were saying, uh, this emphasis on synthesis or sense making would seem to suggest that you're just simply doing the research isn't quite enough to help get you to that place to make some of the best decisions. And I really like how you talk about uncovering the sort of the hidden gems or the hidden insights in that. Because there's one thing in where people just tell you stuff in research and you react to it. It's entirely another to sort of take a, a next step or next steps to really figure out what that means. And like you say, connect it to something. You know, can you talk about that? I mean, is it if there are product managers, if there are people who aren't actively doing research every day, but they're just trying to learn from customers and do their job better and make great stuff. Is it enough to just simply go out and do research? Is that harmful or should we always be really mindful of like being, uh, taking these next steps? Well, Zach, I'd like to respond actually to, to two points of that because I think they're super important. The first one that you made sort of early on is the idea that we don't know and it's useful to go out in the field and remind ourselves of how little we know. And I think that's true, but it's also, I think it's limiting because it it sort of uh, abdicates responsibility on our part to actually have any knowledge. I and mean, I think one of the things that happens during a rich synthesis or sense-making process is you discover that what you know is actually super valuable. It's not just not a complete picture of the story. And so, you know, every, every experience I've had with money counts. It actually does uh, shape the lens that I have then on how I interpret the stuff that I gather in the field. And in that way, you would interpret it very differently than I would because you've had a very different experience with money. I don't even need to know anything about it to know that because everybody's had a different experience with money. That's your lived experience in the world. And so when I conduct synthesis with my teams and, and when they conduct it based on the research they've done, we don't try to say like, like with humility, we're nothing. Instead, we try to separate the fact that we heard some stuff and the folks we heard it from are experts in their lived experience. But I know some stuff and I'm an expert in my lived experience and the connectivity between those things is where the magic happens because, frankly, we're experts in design. If we're not, we probably shouldn't be doing this. And so when I can combine my expertise in design and, and my, my participants' expertise in, in what they've lived, that's where real magic comes from. And so then I sort of fast forward to my second idea here, a point, which is that when you conduct research, it's not enough because it's just a, a point of data. And to echo on my sort of experience or example of, of research and finances, we spent some time with a, with a fellow who's, you know, paycheck to paycheck living with, I think he had like two kids, a wife, not a great house, you know, really trying. You can sort of 
jump to your own conclusions about why someone is paycheck to paycheck. But in this particular case, very, very committed to getting out of the situation he's in. And he showed us how he manages his money. And I've told this story over and over because I find it so fascinating. He has an Android phone and he, and he showed it to us. He pulled it out and he showed us the calculator app. And it said something like $245. And so we start, started talking about it. Or 245 and we started talking about it. And he said, this is the amount of money I have left to spend this month. And I said, okay, so you, you know, paraphrasing, you manage your money on your calculator app on Android. And he said, yeah, because it doesn't clear the balance. And so when I turn my phone off or, you know, close the apps or whatever and come back, it still says the balance number. And so every time I spend something, I can just deduct it. And so if I stop there and we sort of like reflect on that, it, objectively speaking, one could say, well, that's a really bad way to manage your money. If you lose your phone, you're screwed. It's kind of crazy to just manage the balance. You have no prediction ability. You can't really look historically. But for him, that's how he does it. And he's an expert in it. He's an expert in managing his finances that way. So if we don't ever do any sense-making or synthesis on that, we get a very interesting story. And I would not trivialize the story because those are the stories that make executives at banks go like, holy shit, that's what our customers do? But knowing that about this guy doesn't actually help me go make a product to help him. It doesn't, you know, the, the, the obvious result of that would be like, well, let's make a better calculator. And that is probably not a great idea. Right. Uh, but if we can look at the intent behind it, and then I can use my expertise as a, de as a designer to translate what I'm hearing into an innovation or into an idea or a sketch or something like that, that's where the power from, comes from. And so your final point around, you know, should product managers or folks be doing this stuff? Absolutely go do the research. But I would caution everybody not to fall into the trap of saying, I heard this and therefore I should go do it. I heard that they need calculator apps or I heard they manage their money on a calculator. So we need to build calculator apps. And I've seen product managers and, and designers do that a lot where they say, you know, I talked to five people, I learned five things and that's going to be the backlog. And that really does say, well, wait a second, you're an expert in your job, or you better be. And so your opinion counts too. Yeah, the, uh, really, really well said. Absolutely well said, which is the, you know, don't just take what customers say or, or, or look at what they do and try to mimic that in some sort of, in our case, a lot of times, digital medium, right? And then that makes a ton of sense. My question then is, and I, I would think others listening to this are going to say, well, then how do you do that? <laughs> right? So let me be a little more specific on that question too. I guess the way I would ask it is, how do we make sure we're sort of on one side of the line as opposed to the other, right? Like how, how can we recognize if we're in this space where we're just reacting to what people do or reacting to what we saw or heard in research and perhaps know if we're on the other side of the line of like actually making sense of that and connecting it to something more meaningful that will actually be helpful in the lives of our customers. Yeah. So, you know, when we think about how we do this, I can get I suppose I can get super specific on it. And I wouldn't say it's a playbook for us. You know, every project we do is very different and we customize the work we do for our clients. But I would say that there are some steps we take that are very consistent. And so like super pragmatically, we take, we record the sessions we do with them, um, with our participants. So we audio record them and then we transcribe them. Um, increasingly, we've used an external transcription service. And I, I sort of blush at that because I've always been an av advocate of typing it yourself. But that's a conversation for another time. So we have our transcripts and then we externalize every single thing somebody says on a little piece of paper. And this is not like, let's have post-it notes and move them around wearing our tinted glasses on frosted glass and take pictures of ourselves. <laughs> this is like, it's literally every utterance from the field. And so now imagine a wall that's, I don't know, 30 feet long by whatever a wall is, 14 feet high, just covered in these quotes. And then on another wall, we have photos of all the people we talk to and we have little bios of them and sort of an overview you know, like, oh, Frank's the guy with the calculator. Oh, okay, that triggers my my memory of Frank. It doesn't trivialize him to just a calculator. And said it's a it's a way of thinking about him. And then in the context of the studio, myself and my team start to move notes around, find patterns, and talk through what it is we're doing. And so there's sort of a silent phase of this. Everybody's kind of moving around. And then a conversational phase of this collaborative phase where we say, you know what, when, when he was using that calculator, it really made me think of this other woman who had a piece of paper where she could see historically, but she was essentially doing the same thing of debit, 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 start again the next month. But she saved her pieces of paper, right? So this dialogue that I'm having with you right now is the dialogue that's happening in the studio over and over and over. And we try to build in about two weeks for this in our statement of work, sometimes more, sometimes less. And like everything else, it's dependent on, on cost and, um, and resourcing and things like that. But what we're finding then are patterns and we write them down. I mean, we write them down in complete sentences. This isn't words like tech. 
or culture or beauty or happiness, right? Which are things that I've seen happen a lot during synthesis processes. Instead, these are like full, complete thoughts. And we first do a pass for observations. And so we we try to capture the patterns as simple statements of this is what we're seeing. Um, and so one simple observation might be participants that don't necessarily have a, a strong grasp on finances keep track of their finances in simple plus and minus manners. Okay, so like that's not a very insightful statement, but it's a true observation. And then we kind of go, well, why? We ask the question, why do they do that? And when I ask the question why and start to answer it, I'm at a point now where I don't know. I can make guesses and my in, my guesses will be informed based on how much I sort of listened and felt what those folks felt and how many notes I took and how many participants we talked to. But this is where I'm starting to make a, a, a leap. Now I'm starting to get into assumptions. There's infinite answers to the question. I might say something like, well, they do that because they want to make sure they don't run on the money. Or they do that because it's all they've ever learned. Or they do that because their parents taught them how to do it that way. Or they do that because they saw it on TV, right? So I can come up with all sorts of, of reasons that they started that. But then I say, what's underlying the behavior? And for, for the fellow I spoke about, I think what's underlying that behavior is a sense of anxiety because we felt it from him. He never said, I am anxious, but we felt it from him and we watched how important it was that that number didn't go away. And so there's a sense of anxiety for him as the number approaches zero. And he's kind of tracking toward the last day of the month and the zero on the calculator. And so now I've, I've articulated a sense of anxiety. I'm writing that in a nice, complete sentence. And now I have these statements. And this is the point where I think product really, really should start to drive things along with design. So design starts to draw some stuff, but this is the point where product manager starts to, to, should start to say, wow, there's something there that corresponds with what I've heard from the market, that corresponds with the way people are already using our products, or that is in direct conflict with those things. Because now we can start to have conversations that loop in their expertise and their lived experience as somebody who, again, hopefully is an expert in building and shipping products that make money and that resonate with people. So the long or the short of that is we have this craft and rigor to a process, but if I wanted to make it super simple and, and really um, sort of trivialize the activity, all we do is think really hard about what we heard and find patterns. And when I say all we do, I mean all we do for like two weeks. And I think that's <laughs> the I think that's the key. It's not a fly by night, one hour activity. It's really, really thoughtful. Yeah, absolutely. We talk a lot about this on our show. Uh, so it's no surprise that it'll come up again, but it's just taking enough time for analysis, uh, synthesis, you know, to me, I actually define those as slightly different, but it doesn't matter whatever you call it, right? This dedicated time towards, as you would say, uh, in the most uh, simple way of describing it, thinking really hard about what it is you heard, I, I think is probably the most important thing we do in design. That's That's my opinion, because Otherwise, like you say, we are actually reacting to things and we might make a very beautiful thing and a very interesting thing that's simply a reaction to what we heard and actually doesn't serve anybody's needs. And then that, at least by my definition, is actually a failed design, right? Because we didn't do anything to notably improve, in this case, the, the person you mentioned, say Frank's life. All we did was like enhance the same thing he's doing today. We're not actually solving that problem. We're not actually addressing the anxiety for him. Like we're not actually helping manage giving them tools to manage the money any better, right? Well, you know, there's a there's a caveat to that, which is that it may just be fine to make his calculator app easier to use. And I think we get hung up, myself included, around the word innovation, at least I have in my in my career. I think I'm on a different train right now, but that what we make has to be new. It has to be, you know, a step change. It has to be something that nobody's ever seen or that other companies aren't doing. But it, there is value for Frank in just saying, well, you know, if you clear the the balance by mistake, you can bring it back. And like, that's a feature that would be a different feature in a calculator app. And that would go in a backlog and a roadmap, but we wouldn't have come up with that feature if we hadn't seen them use the calculator. That really is an apples to apples, lark, sort of like, I saw this, so we're going to do that. And when you think about what makes product work valuable, but hard, it's that it is a slog of little itty bitty features in support of a big fat vision. And so I think one, you, you mentioned that one of the th most important things for designers is I'm paraphrasing, but to think really hard about this stuff and spend time and, and be contemplative. I do think that a big part of what we do has to be the craft of showing. And because we need to show that vision, we need to show the North Star, we need to draw it, we need to you know, create wireframes or videos or comps or whatever it is your medium du jour is. And then 
map all of the little incremental bullshit that really isn't bullshit in order to get there. And so I would, I would sort of say, well, there's a caveat to don't just do what you saw in the field, which I recognize is what I just said um, about 15 minutes ago, um, <laughs> which is there is value in saying, you know what, this little incremental thing can actually help Frank a great deal. And it's on the way toward making it so he's not using a dumb calculator app. He has a more rich and robust solution to his, his latent needs. Yeah, totally. That point is really interesting for me because, well, a couple things, I guess. You know, one is I think you got to be really honest of like the maturity of your product or your company. So, right. So, if you're working at a startup, brand new company, and you're trying to figure out what your product is and how it really does fit into the lives of the people you're building it for and the market and things like that, I think that perhaps your focus is less on making a better calculator, just so to speak. And more finding those big rocks or those step change kind of things that you would that you would maybe have referred to. But then on the other hand of that, if you have a pretty mature product and you're already delivering value to a lot of people, but maybe they don't recognize that or they're already getting value out of it and there's a way you can just enhance it, then that's absolutely appropriate, right? And the reason I say it's interesting is because you mentioned a working relationship with a product manager. That's absolutely where I would expect to collaborate with somebody like that, work with them and, and say, you know, where are we with this? Like, what kind of change are we looking to make? And that should have happened, by the way, before we ever did any research, right? Like this shouldn't be a thing where we did research and found some needs and then all of a sudden determined we're actually building a brand new product or we're actually just making some simple usability or interaction changes. I don't know. I've never thought about it as, as sort of concisely or precisely as you just described it. If you're If you're in a startup land, you probably want to look at the big rocks. If you're in existing product backlog land, you probably want to look at the small details and that. I'm not, for some reason, I have sort of a, a negative reaction to it as simple as that. And I don't just want to be contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. But I wonder if when you're trying to find quote unquote product market fit, you get too wrapped up in what you make needing to be different. And I've done a couple startups, one, one and a half-ish, which was successful and I don't know, three and a half-ish, which failed. Um, I like the math on this. We we could talk about about the half-ish, I suppose, at some other point. But they didn't succeed or fail based on product market fit in any of the examples, I don't think. Which is like, it's all you hear out of the valley is product market fit, you know, iterate, quick iteration. And they all succeeded or failed based on other things like the quality of the product, the quality of the marketing, the quality of the the charisma of the leadership team, luck, (laughs) serendipity, timing. And so those things, I mean, it, it seems really sort of like discounting our profession, but those things have nothing to do with us. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, in all, as I'm talking this through, in almost all the cases, it really is sort of like luck of the draw. Like, I'm, <laughs> here's an arrogant statement. I'm really smart and I'm really good at my job. And so are the people I surround myself with. And we had three and a half failed startups. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't for lack of product market fit or trying. It was just like, whatever happened didn't happen correctly. And yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of defeatist. I don't know. I've never really articulated it that way, I suppose. It's like, oh, where's the free will and autonomy and, you know, the ability to be autotelic? And I believe <laughs> in, I believe in all of that stuff like like you wouldn't believe. And at the same time, it was like, man, that was a really good idea. There was product market fit. Other people did it at the exact same time and succeeded. Yet we didn't get it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I don't actually see that as like defeatist. I see that as just is realist. And then that's actually something I wish more people I wish I saw more like broadly accepted in our industry is I, I do think that we have this idea that well like design can save anything and design can change anything. And and just in the example you gave right there, it's like, well, that's just not true, unfortunately. It's not to say that it's not insanely important because obviously we you and I <laughs> I don't think would be here having a conversation if it wasn't for the work that that we did and, and the importance of it, right? But yeah, I just think I think understanding it in the larger context of all those things is important. And the reason I kind of zoned in on that is because that's actually what I meant uh, with that statement is it's like a matter of prioritization, right? So maybe we go and we do all this great research that uncovers some some really interesting new needs that we didn't know about that we absolutely should solve. But the priority is actually just making the, the product more marketable and understandable to people. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I absolutely think there's something to that. And and on the one of the things you said, on, on designers think they can solve everything. Andy Budd recently wrote about the, um, and he's a, he's a designer I, I like very much, we're friends and I follow, that he, he was responding to the, to the ship that was blocking the Suez Canal. And he said, you know, here's a, here's a way designers can solve it. We'll go do research into ships for three months and then we'll like do a paper prototype. And it was like, yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. And we would still have a ship stuck in the middle of the canal. So 
so you know like designers do have this sort of hubris quality and i suppose early in my career i did as well you know i'm thinking now about why our clients hire us and in, in many respects the folks that hire us and the upper upper c suite know their customers i mean you don't get to be in charge of a company of the scale of the clients that we work with by you know having by somehow like not knowing anything about your market <laughs> yeah and it seems like it's so silly to even think that but what they're missing is often the story I think one of the value, uh, not I think and not one of, the value we provide is being able to tell a story of an optimistic future that is tied directly to the insights that come out of their customer base. Um, and, and that's very much more focused on the craft of making things than it is on the craft of spending time with people, if I had to you know, sort of separate those things. But the difference is I need the stories and they have to be real. I can't, I can go, I mean, actually I can, I can go make up a story about the fellow with the calculator, but I never would because I'm just not that creative a writer. But now that I have that story, he's real. I have audio of him. I have video. And then I have our process, which is so rigorous in translating that to an opportunity. And then I have this drop dead, sexy, persuasive, charismatic, charismatic vision of the future. That is what my C-suite executive can't do. And they can't articulate and they can't do it as crisply and as, as persuasively as I can. And so that is, I think, again, at least for us, because we're in a very specific sort of world view at Modernist, that is the value of the research and synthesis process. That makes a ton of sense. And it's actually a perfect segue into something I wanted to ask you about, right? So just to kind of zoom out as part of my job in the conversation is like constantly stepping back, rephrasing things, but hoping to... Uh, rephrase them in concise ways is just as we go through. But the, one of the big things I'm hearing from you really is just, yes, the research is fine. Synthesis, making sense of it is the most important part to build that story, right? But then now, we, you know, where we're going with this is that's also really not good enough. It's the, the magic comes in connecting that with something you can show to people and sort of answer the question, so what, right? Because it's one thing to say, we, we have all these rich insights about the people that you serve and that's great. But you have to then say, well, here's what you should do about that. And yeah. so one of the things that I wanted to ask you is like, how do you do that well, right? Because there's a couple things that I feel like everybody, not everybody, lots of people in our industry still to this day struggle with. You know, one is a convincing people that that work leading up to that is important, <laughs> right? And that's like, call it getting buy-in, call it convincing stakeholders, whatever you want. That's one side of the fence. The other is then getting them to accept and want to listen to your ideas or recommendations. So I would love to hear how you go about that. How a how you go about connecting it, but then actually getting that buy in for people to say, yeah, we should we should do that. We should act on that. It's so funny. Both both things I've heard so many times from people that it has to be real. Yet I've never experienced it. And maybe it's because I'm an asshole and like a, a bull in a china shop when it comes to this <laughs> stuff. Like like there's just broken glass all around when I when I try to approach either one, and it and it seems to work. But, you know, on the first side of like, how do you get buy in and money basically and time and support to go do this stuff? I mean, one of the best techniques I've ever seen when I was working in house, which is different than a consultancy, but working in house has been to just go do it on a very small scale and succeed. Clearly, you have to do a great job and then just roadshow the shit out of it. You let executives attach their name to it, have no ownership over it, you know, like, let people steal the slides. It's not something great that you did, but then suddenly they want to be around it and they want to do more. So then go to a, a small area, a little bit bigger one and continue that process. And it's a long, it's a long haul, but like, instead of asking, Hey, can I have some budget to go do research? Well, work 60 hours a week for just four weeks. It's not like it's the end of the world and just do it and then come in and, and show how fucking awesome it was. On the other side, how do you get people to listen to you? I don't know. And this is where me having like broken glass all around me is not the right approach. And I don't actually think it's relevant one way or the other. I think it's about having the artifact speak for you. And this really comes down to one of the things that myself and other designers who are somewhat trained in design have, have been pissed off about as we watch our field evolve over the last 15, 20 years has been the, the separation of research and design. And by design, I mean like making things has evolved on purpose because there's specialization in the field and because we need depth in both areas. But I don't know how you can be the person that does the research and the synthesis and then be a different person who does the making. I just don't see that ever, ever working. 
And so that means that there has to be a hybrid skill set there. And you have to be able to make shit that looks, feels, and acts awesome. This isn't, you know, bullshit hangman style sketches on a whiteboard. It has to evolve into something polished. Level of polish we can talk about, but it just has to be, it has to be high in craft. And I've seen a lot of folks on the design research side who have ended up in design research because they can't do or feel they can't do the other part. And I think that's a somewhat of a practical travesty, which is that I, I certainly believe they can. I believe anybody can do that shit, can do the making part, the craft part, but they haven't taken the opportunity to try. And a lot of that just comes down to confidence. I, I'll take, I retract my word just. A lot of that comes down to confidence, which is the big part of school is learning to build that confidence, learning to build the craft as well. And if you never went to a traditional four-year institution for a variety of reasons, all of which are good ones, mostly because they're fucking expensive, way too expensive, you never really got your off to that three or four year immersive, try, 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 fail, 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 support, 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 mentorship. Now I'm building the confidence to go make stuff. So I think when we go buy in on my ideas, it's finding a vehicle and a mechanism that is so well done in craft that people can't help but want to see those ideas succeed. Yeah. Awesome. Really, really awesome. I'm just kind of sitting here processing everything you said and and trying to figure out like, again, how I want to summarize that for everybody listening. Uh, But then also the things I want to ask you next, because there's there's so much that I want to dig into there. But, you know, really at the height of it is in terms of convincing people you should do this work, just go and do it. (laughs) And and actually, you know, this is probably some of my bias, uh, but I really strongly agree with you because I have given the same advice. Like, Zach, it's such shitty advice, and I acknowledge it when I give it too. It's so, I mean, it's like, it's like just go do it. And I, I know, yeah, it's I can't not really imagine, helpful, right? No, it's it sucks, and I can't imagine being on the receiving end of it. Yet, I don't. I mean, I have lots of other ways to caveat it, and I work with students on it. But it's like I don't want to hear somebody say, you know, oh, how do you become? I recently took up the sitar about three years ago. Well, how do you become a better sitar player? Oh, well, just do it. I mean, that's the, it's the right answer. And it's like, well, fuck yeah. off. I, that's not what I, I don't want to hear that. You, you yeah. fucking do it. Fuck yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's just it. That's just it. I mean, the thing is, is I think that we want to, we live in an interestingly an ever more complicated world. And I choose the word complicated very specifically, not more complex. I don't believe our world is any more complex than it was 2000 years ago, right? I think we choose to make it more complex. It's not any more, it's just more complicated. And the thing is, is like, this has always been true. Like to get better at that thing, you do that thing, right? And I know that's not awesome advice and I've absolutely given it where the reaction is like polite smiles and continuing to nod and going like, okay, this guy's not going to be any fucking help to me at all right. when I get great, there, right? Great teaching, Zach. Great teaching, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing is, the thing is, I still think it's right. Now, I, I, do, I do think that, you know, we could be better at like, well, how can you jumpstart that if you're... Maybe if you don't have experience in it or you just started at this organization and then nobody seems to value it or whatever, there's absolutely more that can go into that, right? But the fact of the matter is you should still do it and then show it. I think that, right, because that's the ultimate outcome of this to really get people on board of wanting to give a shit about design research. Now, then on the other end of that, uh, we, you know, kind of what I hear you saying, which is really interesting. And I don't know how much of this has to do with sort of when we, quote unquote, grew up in the field, right? Because back then there were no specific researchers and specific designers. I I had never worked at any place that had like a separation of concerns, right? We just all did all of it. Or you were just a designer and you didn't actually do research in some cases, right? I, I think that you're right to say just because you specialize in one or the other doesn't mean you can't do, have, be multidisciplinary. So let's say you're a really awesome designer. Well, you could still totally do research. And then on the flip side of that, if you're a really great researcher and you're just like, oh man, a terrible design, that's well, still, you're able to tell a story and you can choose a medium to tell that story. And it sounds like even, you know, you and your folks at your studio do that in all sorts of different mediums. It's not always wireframes or an interface, right? And, and that in and of itself can help people really get on board to say, well, I should take action on this, right? Am I summarizing this pretty fairly? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it can be summarized, right? Like it, it's more of a talk around it kind of thing. And, and you know, that. When you're looking for life advice, I suppose if somebody can make it succinct, maybe it's not great advice because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's life, right? And it's a mess. But I, I, I mean, a couple of thoughts. One is like when I started my, my work about 20 something years ago, there, was, there were companies like eLab and Interval Research and Scient and Viant that were doing qualitative research 
and only qualitative research as far as I can remember, but they were, but the people doing it were trained to design. And again, as far, and not everybody, but the ones that I know were trained in formal craft-based communication or industrial design programs. And so they still had that backbone and tendency of making things. So I'm reflecting a little bit more on my, well, just go do it. And so let's add some maybe less pedantic, obnoxious qualifiers to that. So here's, here's some things I have seen work. One is just go do it with a friend. Find somebody who's just as shy and self-deprecating about doing it and commit to doing it together. And it's very much like, let's lose weight together. Let's go running together, right? Like help, hold each other accountable to it. Another is find a mentor. This is harder. It's, it's very much like, oh, just go find your mentor. And that's hard. But I think you can find folks who have been doing this longer and say things like, will you be willing to spend one to two hours with me for a week? Or sorry, every week for a long time. And folks will say no. People ask me a lot and I say no. But then some folks ask and I say yes. And I think that's helpful. And then another is, I mentioned this idea of learning to play the sitar. And, and one of the things that finally got me to do it, because I wanted to do this since I was 15, is I imagined myself in 10 years being good at it. And I said, all right, I'm fully aware that I'm going to suck at it now. But in 10 years, I don't want to then be going, man, in 10 years, I'd be really good at it. So right. that was like, that for me, that recast what it would take and, and why I was doing it. It gave me leeway. It said, I have 10 years to get good at this thing. But it also gave me a, a vision of myself looking back that I didn't like. And that was enough to kick me into high gear to go find a, you know, just like I just said, find a mentor and uh, beg, borrow and pay him to help me. <laughs> so I, I, I think when I think when I'm looking at it, more strong advice to give, those are the ones. And then the last piece of advice I have, and this is somewhat economically not fair, is go to a long expensive school program. I'll put expensive in air quotes. It doesn't have to be millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it probably is more expensive than these 10-week boot camps or these eight-week boot camps. And it probably is longer than those because the duration, that the expense justifies the duration and the duration just forces this amount of cycles. And the more cycles you take, drawing, 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 critiquing, showing what you said, getting in front of other people, the more that muscle memory and ability will, will build up and you'll get better, period. Like full stop, you will get better. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think that that's a, it's a very fair articulation, deeper articulation of just go and do it, right? You, you've given some examples to say, well, here are the next steps and here's what that means and here's why that matters, you know? And a couple of things that just made me think of like, uh, one of the things that I wanted to say that I relate to <laughs> when you say, Bull in a china shop, glass broken everywhere. I was, I think I was absolutely that earlier in my career. Absolutely. Like I can relate to that so much. I've been literally called like a bulldog by peers, you know, in the past kind of thing. <laughs> Lovingly. I, I would, I would hope. Yeah. I would hope in an endearing way. I don't think I've, I had never taken offense to it. So maybe that's either my, uh, my lack of like social understanding or it, because it was actually endearing. Who knows? Uh, you know, maybe in 20 more years, we'll find out, but I could relate to that. And I think, sure, it takes a certain personality to be that and just be like whatever force in the room. That's not for everybody. And I recognize that. So I think you know, the important thing is like, here's the advice I give to people when, when to do it. And they're like, yeah, but what if, what if it sucks? Or like, what if I, what if somebody doesn't want me to do it? Or they're upset today. I usually tell people like, just play out that scenario, right? What's the worst that could happen if you went and literally did above and beyond in your job? Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? I want you to actually play that scenario out. Are you going to get yelled at? Are you going to get fired? Well, probably not, right? Like, why would somebody ever fire you for doing more work? That's kind of outrageous. So long as you're getting the job that you want to get done and you're doing that at high quality, if you're just trying to add more value, I've never heard of anybody getting in trouble for that. Not in any meaningful trouble, right? So it's like then, if you sort of find the edge of the cliff, all of a sudden you can take a few steps back and go, huh, I bet you this will be okay. <laughs> and, and then it's like, well, what if it sucks? And what if it's no good? And they're like, well, I don't want to listen to it. I'm like, so then what? What happens? At, what, what do you do if that happens? It's like, well, I guess nothing. I'm like, right. But did you waste your time? No, you practiced. And, and if it sucks, good for you because you learned what sucks and what doesn't now, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the what is the worst that can happen if you extend that out is, is you do get fired. And then, okay, play that out. Well, it's not like that's the end. <laughs> that was the last job I could ever get. And now I'm destitute. It's like, no, that, then you'll be pissed off and then you'll be sad. And then you'll have to go through the garbage networking to get another job. And then you will have another job and you will have learned a lot. So it's like, yeah, I mean, I like to play out the worst that happens game and really play it out. 
when folks look at at least now LinkedIn or you know any job board, Indeed, you're like, holy shit, there are so many jobs. There are so many friggin' design jobs that it like, yeah, you get fired, fine, go go find another job. Your job is not your life, you know. Like, yeah, you will yeah. you will be fine. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's just that's one of the things that I I really give people advice on, regardless of what they're doing, but especially you know because I. I'm in this field as well. And I, and I tend to talk with a lot of those folks. So it's like, yeah, just play that out. Like what's the worst that happened? And by the way, let's say I've never, ever heard of this happening, but let's say somebody does fire you. Cause they're like, yeah, you're doing too good of a job. You're trying to <laughs> provide more value to our group. If they fired you for that, that's a story you get to tell to your potential next employer. That's right. And it's that's like, why, why did you get fired from that job? He's like, well, I was trying to do extra work for them. <laughs> which, which, which is like such bullshit to hear, but, but totally. No, but totally, you get a story. You're absolutely right. And honestly, the humility of the story sells extraordinarily well. I don't mean to, to imply that getting a job is a sham, but you are selling yourself. And that sells really, really well because it's like, you know what? I've gone through the ringer. Like, I get it. I get what it takes now to do X, Y, and Z. And when I interviewed at, Savannah College of Art and Design, man, this is like 18 years ago. I interviewed a teach. Who am I to teach when I'm 21 years old or whatever it was? But I had interviewed for like an electronic arts faculty position and I bombed the interview, like absolutely terrible. And I had then driven over to the industrial design building to, to get a tour and I was commiserating with a professor there and I had nothing to lose and I just let it out. Like, I just fucked that up. It was so bad. I'm so friggin' awful. You know, I had no business being over there. My expertise is in design and interaction design. And he was like, well, you know what? Like, I like your attitude. I like your demeanor. That was very real. We're hiring. Wouldn't you like to come interview here? And I was like, okay. So, you know, what, what attracted him to me in the first place, and his name is Bob Fee, and he's a good friend, and he's a great guy. Um, what attracted him to me was not my portfolio and my CV, because he never saw it. It was the humility that he heard of having just gotten trashed by by an experience and I, you know i think there's value to that too it was very clear that i was about to learn that from that and he was like wow that's that is the kind of i don't know human i want around me now let's look at the table stakes of can you actually do this job yeah absolutely you know that's i still when i interview anybody to actually like hire them and i've shared this advice and by the way it's not even mine i stole it from an old cto i used to work with years ago he literally told me this in my interview, which was really cool. A very like cool and weird meta moment. Um, you're also being interviewed. This guy, by the way, was like head of cloud computing at Yahoo before like cloud computing was a big thing. You're just like an actual rocket engineer. I mean, just genius kind of guy, right? And he's telling me this as he interviews me. He goes, when I interview people, I'm looking for three things. Number one, are you a culture fit? Number two, can you do the job? Number three, do you want the job? He's like, and that's it. Everything else doesn't matter. And he's like telling me this as he's asking questions. I'm like, which one is it? Which one is it right now? Which one is it? Am I, is he figuring out if I'm a culture fit? Is he figuring out if I can do the job? <laughs> but if you break it down, right, it's kind of exactly what you said. Like two out of those three have nothing to do with your actual qualifications. It has everything to do with like passion and attitude. And it has everything to do with what kind of person you are. And can you be some positive to the group if we were to add you to that? At least I hope that that's what culture fit means. Maybe I'm being a little too gracious. We have a lot of work on doing, you know, and fixing uh, what culture fit means, I think in our, in the tech world, that's a whole nother podcast. But, you know, if you think about that, it's all about really who you are. And then let's take a step back. Do you have some basic qualifications? Like, have you done design and or research before? Do you at least get how to do it in practice? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with a lot of that. And I'm, I'm now reflecting on my very first internship was with a company called Trilogy here in Austin. And they were, are, were, I don't know, well known for culture fit being a thing. And back in the late 90s, that absolutely meant white, upper class, whatever you want to call it. But it also meant um, sort of a, a metaphorical middle finger to normal to normal job expectations. And mm -hmm. I just remember I got the internship because a woman who was an alumni was visiting. And I mean, this is such a dumb reason to get an internship. But, you know, I was an arrogant 17 year old or whatever you are in college. And I was sitting on a table talking about how everything was all fucked up at the school and everybody sucked. And she was like, wow, you have very strong opinions. Would you like to interview? <laughs> and so like what attracted her was, was strong opinions. And then it was like, oh, and by the way, we need to see your portfolio. And there's an expectation that it's good. But the expectation that it was good was sort of like a, oh, and by the way, it was an oh, and by the way, right? It really was table stakes. What yeah. started first was, are you a culture fit? And in that particular company, a culture fit was being sort of like very 
strongly, loudly opinionated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. It's one of those things, too, where like I've told people I, I couldn't anybody I've ever hired. I couldn't tell you where they went to school. I couldn't tell you like the places they've worked at before necessarily. It's not stuff that I paid attention to. It was all about, well, talk to me about who you are. Talk to me about how you think about this work. And through that, you know, I would like you to demonstrate in some way that you can do it. And then let's figure out if we should work together. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you don't apply to be pick your job at an insurance agent if you can't be an insurance agent. But then people will come to you for a certain, that's a really shitty example because nobody likes insurance agents, but whatever. <laughs> you get the point. You got to be able to. You got to be able to do the job and then everything else like, okay, I mean, another way of thinking about that is there are thousands of people now who have studied whatever you want to call it, UX design, blah, 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 blah. So the expectation that you can do the job is like, like the starting point, because if not, there's thousands of people who can. Great. Now, how am I going to differentiate between those thousands of people? Well, do I want to actually work with you ever or all of the time? I mean, that really d- does come down to who are the, like, the people I like to surround myself and my team with. Absolutely. Well, so look, John, we covered a lot of ground here and even went pretty deep on some of the synthesis stuff, which is really cool and something I think that our industry needs to sort of refocus on and uh, and really pay attention to do more of in spite of, you know, doing design and product faster and more efficiently. So that was awesome. This was a really good chat. And I need to be respectful of your time because I realize we're kind of coming up to the end of the hour here when we had a chance to chat. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, and I do this with it at the end of every episode is like, if I just got hit by a bus and nobody knew what we talked about, but they came up to you and said, well, what was the podcast? What was it? What was that all about? What did you guys talk about? How would you sum that up for people? I would say tune in and, and hear some thoughts by some old guys who have had some experiences and maybe you can learn a thing <laughs> or two about, uh, about how to improve a little bit of your job and how to uh, improve a little bit about your, your perspective on design. Fair enough. I appreciate that. I earned my, the gray hairs that I have. Oh, it, are you going to tell everybody that it's my birthday and your birthday? Yeah, we should. Definitely. We should bring that up. That's really, really wild. So uh, at the time of recording this, this is going to come out after the fact, but at the time of recording this, it happens to be both John's birthday and my birthday. So today I found out we share a birthday. And How we, old are you going to be, Zach? I am 36 today. Oh, I'm going to be 43. No, I am 43. Good. Today is the big day. That's it. So there you go. I mean, and, All downhill. <laughs> <laughs> a lot to look forward to. That's right. <laughs> uh, but that's, su- I mean, super cool just to kind of find that out. Uh, and so once again, happy birthday to you. Yeah. So this is really awesome. I appreciate you jumping on. Is there anything that you want to share with folks that we didn't actually cover today already? No, just uh, one thing. If they're interested in hearing more about my perspective on things, I write an awful lot on my company's website, which is modernststudio.com. And I tweet as J-K-O-L-K-O. And you can hear some of the more contemplative stuff and also some more of the broken glass John <laughs> voicing opinions that may or may not be useful to anyone. It's going to be such a change on Twitter, someone throwing around strong opinions. Oh, yeah, that's right. Unheard of. <laughs> okay. John, this was really awesome. Again, I appreciate your time. Big fan of your work. Been following your stuff for years and really great to, to have a chat with you, quote unquote, live, at least over audio. Appreciate it. And yeah. Hope everybody gets more out of this. A couple old guys talked about some stuff. Take their takeaway, a different perspective. We are both full of opinions. Uh, so if you, if you want to follow up on that, I'm sure you can reach out to John or myself and we're happy to expand on either one of those though. So. All right, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Zach. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the research and insights tool that helps you analyze, search, and share all your research in one place. So you can go from data to insights to action faster and easier. Check out Aurelius for yourself with a 30-day trial by going to AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot if you would give us a review on iTunes to let others know what you think. You can catch all new episodes of the Aurelius podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts like iTunes, Spotify, and more. Stay up to date when new episodes come out by signing up for email updates on our website.